right. Thank you guys for coming. So my name is William. So I am going to quickly uh, describe or explain to you what are platonic solids. Right. In principle, what these words mean when you put them together. Right. So yeah, so I just uh, precursed my uh, question. So what are platonic solids? So actually, let me start by telling you my little self story. So I first, when did I first come across this phrase, right? Platonic solids. I read about them when I was in my first year at, a uni at university. And I was reading a book, okay? So of course, I'm not reading this book, right? Dummy for, reading for dummies. I was reading something else, okay? Something called Metaphysics by a metaphysicist called Peter Van in Wagen. Right, so it's a real book, so if you're interested, feel free to look at it. Uh, it's in the realm of philosophy, so they will ask you many weird questions and try to push you hard to think about that. Okay? And here is one of the questions I run into in this book. Okay? Suppose somehow now you manage to talk to an alien very far away. Or it's different if he's next to you, but imagine he's very far away on a different, completely... Uh, uh, planet that you have never seen before, right? And at a certain point of your discussion, you want to explain to him, okay, what is five, or what five is? How can you tell him? Right? And presumably, he doesn't have the palm or the hand like us, so he cannot look at his hands or fingers and can't. So how will you do that? All right. Uh, well, I stretched my head and couldn't find a satisfactory answer. So I flip through the pages. In the end, the book give me this weird answer. All right. Okay, five is the number of platonic solid. Right. So you don't have to show your hands to the, to the aliens. You just tell them, okay, count the numbers of platonic solids. Okay. So by now you should probably you have the same feeling as I did before. Right. So what do you mean by that? What are platonic solids? So that's my first time when I came when came across this phrase. Okay, uh, you should know this, right? So I'm just like you. If there's something I don't know, okay, I'll go to Wikipedia, right, and type in platonic solids. This is what you will find. Okay, it's very common to many wiki pages on mathematics, right? They are cryptic. So if you read the first line, all right, okay. A platonic solid is a regular convex polyhedron with congruent faces of regular polygons and the same number of faces meeting at each vertex. All right. If you don't know what they mean, that means you're normal. All right. So let me maybe quickly go through them. But before that, uh, now there's a good thing shown on this, video, on this page. Now I can clearly see there are five of them. Right? And I can see their shape and uh, how they're named. All right, so that seems to agree with my book, the metaphysics book that I read about before. Okay, so what are they? All right, let me go. Uh, okay, read the fine prints. Right. So first, uh, these things have to be convex. Right? So what do we mean by that? Actually, it turns out to be a very difficult mathematical concept to tell people what convex is. All right. So we will use our intuition. All right. It, especially when I try to compare convex with concave. So if it's a 2D polygon, then you should have no problem understanding that, right? So, well, these are convex. In some sense, all the corners are pointing out, right? These are concave polygons. Some of the angles are not pointing out, just like this one, this one, this one, and these two, right? So they are like concave inwards, so they, they're forming a kind of a hole or cavity. So we can apply a similar concept to 3D polyhedron, right? So for example, this one, okay, looks like a ball shape, so I know it's convex. This one, maybe it's hard for you to see, but you look deeper, okay? This actually is a cavity there, there's a hole there. So this is a concave polyhedron. All right, so, okay, what else? All right, it, these solids also have to have faces with regular polygons. So what does that mean? Just to make things simpler, 
That means all the edges of my polygon have a polyhedron have to have the same length. Right? I cannot have something certainly longer than the others. And this one should be easy to understand. I should have the same number of faces meeting at each vertex. Right? So if I look at each single vertex uh, and I saw how many and I count how many faces is meeting at that vertex, I should always get the same number. Right? So for example, my little demonstration here, one of the platonic solids called tetrahedron, right? So it has four corners, right? One, two, three, and four. So if I look at each corner, then it will be connected by one face, two face, and three faces. It doesn't matter which one you pick, you will always have three faces meeting at a corner, all right? And then now you should think a little a little bit deeper than, wow, these actually turns out to be very demanding constraints and it's not easy to come up with solids like this. So that's why there's only five of them, okay? And for convenience, most of the time we will name these solids after their names, after uh, the number of faces. So for example, this one has only four faces, okay, just like this one, we'll call them tetrahedron because tetra in English means four. Right? So the next one is a cube. So the usual one we, we will see. Uh, it has six faces. So sometimes we will call it hexahedron, so and so forth. Right? So the next one, we have eight faces, uh, 12 faces, and 20 faces. So if you are brave and, okay, if you happen to find the sixth one, please tell me, because you will be very famous and you may get a very big prize in future. Right. But unfortunately, apparently, there are mathematical proof uh, that has confirmed us that there can only be five of them. Okay. All right. So what's so special about these platonic solids? Right? Why do we care about them? Uh, for one thing, uh, I would like to mention is that they are highly symmetrical. Right? So we kind of have an idea what we mean by symmetry. Right? Uh, let me give you a Another simple, simple way to think about this. Uh, suppose I start with a tetrahedron, right? I can randomly label the corners just like this. One, two, three, four, okay? I can label them one way. Okay, and then you talk to your friends, okay, ask them to label the corners in their own way. Of course, most of the time, you will not agree with each other, right? So maybe, okay, this is how he labeled his corners, right? But it doesn't matter because now and then, well, okay, you look at the left polyhedron, you look at the, look at the right tetrahedron, well, okay you, okay, you can move them around and in the end, you will always be able to show that the left one is exactly the one on the right and there's no difference. So that's what we call symmetrical, right? They are the same. Uh, of course, such a property may not always be true. Imagine I have a pyramid. It looks similar, but a pyramid has a base of square instead of a triangle, right? So if I follow the same trick, right? Take a pyramid, okay, go to Egypt, right? Take a pyramid and then label the corners. Okay, I can label it this way. I talk to my friend. They label it in a different way. Aha, I can tell the difference because this point at the top is giving away the answer, right? This point is different and it's special from the others. And I can tell these two pyramids from each other just by looking at how you label the top one. Here I call this two, my friend will label it number three. So in this sense, I would say, okay, the tetrahedron that I look at before will have more symmetry than the pyramid. Okay, great, so they're symmetrical, okay, may, big deal for mathematicians, maybe not for us, you may think. Uh, but before that, let me tell you why they're called platonic solids, right? So, platonic solids. Uh, the answer should be obvious, because of course it's named after him, right? Plato, right? And he, he has very immense interest in these objects, okay, because in, uh, all over the place, he will tell you, okay, symmetry is very important. It shows the beauty of our universe. 
look around our universe, you will see symmetries all the time. And you will come across these solids all the time. He's so into it that he thinks actually these solids has something to do uh, as the basic building blocks of our universe. Okay? And quick, this is clearly stated in one of his books called uh, Timius. Right? So it was written about 360 BC. All right? uh, I hope you remember for the Greek, for the ancient Greek, they think the world is made up of four elements, right? Fire, water, air, and earth. Okay. And Plato, uh, with his own reasoning, so he will associate these elements with some of the Platonic solids. All right? So for example, for this octahedron, he associated that with air, the cube with earth, tetrahedron with fire, and isosahedron, so that was a 20-sided polyhedron, he associated that with water, okay? And to the extent that he think, okay, if you're really able to look very fine, fine to the water molecules, right? This should be the shape of the water molecule. So he believed, all right? All right, so of course now we don't think this way, right? So we don't believe in the four element theory, and I'm not sure we will talk about the shape of the fire particle, right? So what is our modern belief, okay? Uh, I think beyond all shape of platonic solids, right? This is the shape we now value the most, right? We think it's very important. If I look around, important things around me, I will, look, I will come across shapes like this. Agree? If you don't, let me give you some example, right? Okay, smartphone, tablets, and maybe high definition TV. Right? These are all in this shape. All right? So we will no we are no longer talking about platonic with platonic solids anymore. Oh, but of course that's more like a joke. Okay? So in modern times, why do we care about symmetry anyway? All right? Okay, something the left looks like the right. So why would I care? Uh, we do care especially in modern science, because it indeed turns out to be very important for uh, understanding our world. For example, symmetry can often be used to explain phenomena or observation. All right. For example, all right, if, okay I'm, okay, I'm not Galileo, so if a guy went to a top tower and then tried to drop something to the ground, right, so you may ask him this question. If I drop a ball, why does it move vertically only, but not sideways, right? So it falls to the surface of the ground vertically. It drops, but it doesn't move left or right. Why? All right, uh, quickly you can use this symmetry argument to answer this question. Of course, there should not be any sideways motion, right? Because everywhere on the, on the surface looks the same to the ball, so there's no reason for the ball to move to the left or to the right. So you will only move down and up. Okay. So only how close you are to the ground matters. That's one thing. Another thing is symmetry sometimes can quickly guide us through towards the answers. It can give me a quick way to find the answers. For example, right, if I start a fire in empty space, what will be the shape of the fire? So in, in empty space, I really mean nothing, right? So no stars, no earth around, so it's just nothing. And you start a fire, okay, of course that means you may need air or oxygen somewhere. So somehow if you manage to start the fire, what will it look like, all right? Okay, you think about that and then your symmetry to help you. It should be spherical because while in the empty space, right, there's no preferred direction. Everywhere looks the same to you. So there's no reason for the fire to be in, like pointing up or down, right? Because in deep space, you cannot just tell up from, up from down or left to right, right? So everywhere behaves the same to you, All right? So such kind of reasoning is particularly important for chemistry. For example, well, in chemistry, we'll run into like many like atoms, making up molecules, right? And at some point, you may wonder, 
if I have a compound made up of a certain number of atoms, what will the molecule look like? Right? What will be the shape of the molecule? All right. It helps you because sometimes if I look at the molecules, uh, they're made, different parts are made up of exactly the same type of atoms. Right? So it's the same thing. So the shape must be the same. Right? So if I, for example, if I look at this uh, molecule, right, I have something in the center connected to four different atoms. Right? So four, these four atoms are the same. Right? So that's why the resulting molecule will also be the same no matter I'm looking at along the first direction, second, third, and the fourth. They should all be the same. So this one will be slightly different because I, can, I have a center more atoms, okay, three identical atoms. All right, so these three directions should be the same, but the fourth one is slightly different. Right? So anything happens here will be fine to me. Right? But all these three has to be similar to each other. So that means, okay, if I look at the molecules harder, sometimes I should expect them to show me some symmetry in their shape. Uh, so that brings me to one particular example called the buckyball, C60. So C60 indeed is, is chemical formula because it's a molecule made up of 60 carbon atoms. Right? So you go and pick out 60 carbon atoms, join them together. So this is the C, uh, the atoms, the molecules. Okay, it's important uh, because in the 1996 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was actually uh, awarded for the discovery of this buckyball and other similar molecules. All right. So let me quickly show you the shape. All right. So this is the shape of the molecule. So it's kind of like a spherical shape, and each dot here represents a carbon atom and the lines joining them are the bonds they develop between each other. Okay, so the left hand side, okay, you may be a bit confused, but actually it turns out I will see some six-sided, okay, hexagons, sometimes pentagons. So if I color them correctly, actually it's exactly the football shape. So in laboratory, chemist has managed to make molecules that look like a football. But I would like to draw you, pay your, ask you to pay attention. Right? This is not a platonic solid. Right? So as I mentioned before, for platonic solid, all surfaces have to look the same. But of course, this is not the same. Right? This one is five-sided. This one is six-sided. Okay? It's called a truncated isosahedron. All right? So why do we call it like that? Okay? Isosahedron, okay, actually this name is one of the platonic solid, and it's like this, all right, 20 sided polyhedron. All right, it's truncated, that means, okay, I'll start with this isosahedron, and take my knife and try to chop out its edges, all the vertices, right? So I'll cut this one, cut this one, cut this one, and then I'll get this. Okay, okay imagine if I cut this vertex away, I will get a uh, resulting uh, flat pentagonal surface like this, right? So that's why we give that such a name, all right? Okay, so why did I mention this? Because actually I'm trying to give you a commercial. So in the, in the workshop in the afternoon with paper foldings, this is one of the uh, shape we will try to make with origami, right? So uh, my helpers will help me, uh, will also help you to do this. So we'll make up little, uh, subunits like this, try to join them together and then make the buckyball in real life, okay? So I think I'll stop here. So thank you for your attention. So I hope you have learned, take something up about platonic solids from my discussion.